Hello YouTubers out there, this is Jerry at the Movies with your host Jerry Sarabia. And today, since the beginning of October is uh, pretty close by, we're going to discuss John Carpenter's Halloween, very briefly. Um, it's celebrating its 35th anniversary uh, this year, even though it technically came out in 1978. So 35th anniversary would really be next year, 2013, not 2012, but still. Uh, 35 Years of Halloween is going to be re-released in theaters, um, I imagine sometime in October, or in, uh, close to Halloween. And um, I want to discuss that film because, you know, back when I saw the film, I, I saw the network television premiere. I believe it was a network television premiere back in 1980. I had not seen it in theaters. I didn't know what this film was about at all. Uh, as I watch the film, I mean, it seems to be about an escaped mental patient who comes back to uh, the town he was born in, where he had uh, murdered his sister 16 years earlier, and uh, is after these babysitters. We don't know why. Uh, that's part of the film's mystery, its power. And he, you know, of course, pursues Laurie Strode, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, in her feature film debut. And, um, she survives the attack. I mean, I don't think I'm giving anything away anymore, but everybody should know really what Halloween is all about. Um, but that film, when, when I first saw it, it scared me. And the ending was quite scary. You know, it's become kind of a cliche now that the monster is never really dead, or the killer is never really dead. It's, uh, it's more than just a cliche at this point. <laughs> but uh, when I first saw that film, it was the first time I'd seen something like that. Um, I mean, I guess prior to that, there was Carrie from 1976, where Sissy Spacek's hand reaches out from where the house collapsed that she was in, and there are all these rocks, but that was a dream sequence. So it didn't really mean that Carrie was actually back, but uh, it gives you a, a jolt. But Halloween, it's a little scarier, because what happens is we don't know what this guy's all about. I mean, he's a mental patient. We don't know why he's back in this town. Granted, this has been explained in other sequels, which explanations weren't always necessary, but uh, um, but the film has this uh, power to it. It's, it's atmosphere. It, it just is very chilling. And it just shows how talented, supremely talented John Carpenter uh, still is. Uh, I mean, he's an amazing director. Any director who makes a film like Halloween is... Uh, someone to really admire because that that film it has just a unique power about it. it it's hard to explain because it does it through suspense and atmosphere and that music that john carpenter wrote that everybody knows it's eerie as hell and memorable and uh one must wonder what it took to create such a score i mean it was it's an amazing score um but that ending always scared me and even to this day, despite all the slasher films that came since Halloween, um, th there's something quite scary about it. And I think what, what it was is, if you recall, uh, Donald Pleasance, the late Donald Pleasance, plays Dr. Sam Loomis, and he shoots Michael Myers several times, six times, and Michael Myers falls off the balcony, and we see the shot, the, the viewer, not... Sam Loomis of Michael Myers' body on the ground, so we assume he's dead. It's over. The nightmare is over. And of course, Laurie Strode said, uh, says the boogeyman, uh, is that the boogeyman? And he says, yes, as a matter of fact, it was. And then he walks over to the balcony, and Michael Myers is gone, and then the music starts. But what sells that scene, which isn't often discussed, I think, is that Laurie Strode knows what's also just happened. Because she's stabbed this guy with a, <laughs> a knitting needle. She stabbed him with a knife. Uh, you know, we had already thought a few times back during the climax of the film that he was dead. And she realizes he's not, and she starts to cry. And just, I mean, and then you see Donald Pleasance looking up you know, beyond the trees, where is this guy? This is this is not good. And that's how the film ends. 
Um, Rob Zombie could never have done justice to that movie. Uh, he remade it, and he did a poor remake, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the other angle I want to discuss is, of course, uh, pretty much been discussed to death, I guess, in other circles. Cisco and Ebert had always brought this up back in the day. Is that, of course, there were imitations of Halloween since then. Friday the 13th, My Bloody Valentine, The Burning, um, uh, you name it. I mean, there were a bunch during the 1980s. Uh, just a whole bunch. Of course, sequels to Halloween, more sequels to Friday the 13th. Um, you know, it's funny, I can't even name all of them. There were just a whole bunch. Um, but they not, not one of them really captured the visceral atmospheric power of John Carpenter's film. And also, the other problem is that the filmmakers that tried to duplicate that film thought that what made that film work was something that was not actually in the film, and that was the gore. There was no gore. There is no gore in Halloween. Uh, there's violence, a lot of it implied, not actually seen. And that's what makes that film so special. It's not about the murders. Uh, it's just about three innocent teenage high school girls who like to smoke pot, have sex, um, <laughs> can't drink beer, just normal high school teens, and there's this menace, and we, we, I think we get, we get to care about them too, you know, especially PJ Souls, um, and of course Jamie Lee Curtis, I mean, she made a very vulnerable character out of uh, Laurie Strode, but she survives, and, uh, but that's what sold that film. John Carpenter just did it in a way that no one else could. And so the imitators didn't come close to it. Now, I'm 41 years old now, and I, you know, at my work, I deal with uh, some young people in their early 20s, and they admire John Carpenter's film. Um, much more than Rob Zombie's remake. And that tells me a lot. That tells me that maybe they, they didn't realize that what they, you know, let's put it this way. I often find that when people talk about gory films, uh, they may not specifically remember the actual stabbings, the decapitations, all the blood, the, you know, viscera. Uh, but they think that they'd seen it in some other films that don't have it. Um, and that's the difference. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, Toby Hooper's film from 1974, was at one time considered the ultimate gore film. And uh, again, there, it's not visible on screen. You just don't see it. Um, the sequels managed to show much more gore, although not even near to what you see nowadays. Uh, especially even on television, but that's for another time. Um, but that's, I think that's what I want people to remember, and hopefully, I know what's going to happen. I think this film, Halloween, will be re-released in theaters, and people say, oh, God, that was boring. You know, I can just imagine. Uh, I would hope not, but I think younger people just expect the push-button mentality of one gory murder every few minutes, and then we're, we're good, you know, and... Uh, they they lose sight of the fact that horror at its best, usually, and of course there are exceptions to the rule, but uh, like The Exorcist, which is one of my, if not my favorite supernatural horror film, aside from Halloween. But is that horror at its best deals with the imagination. What is imagined is often scarier than what you actually see. So what you have to put mentally in your mind that you think you saw but you didn't see, makes the, ex the experience even more vivid, especially if you're dealing with a killer on the loose. I mean, after a while, it gets boring, folks, when you see one graphic bloody murder after another. Um, now, I have a link on here for a story I wrote, uh, which I put off for a long time, but I wrote it, and it's a screenplay, um, and it's called Halloween, The Loomis Prophecy. And although there's technically maybe a little bit more gore than 
John Carpenter's film, I try to subdue that as much as possible. Um, and if you read it, you know, hopefully you'll you'll enjoy it. But it was a way of capturing what I love about Halloween, which is uh, the invocation of the supernatural. It really invoke, you know, it evokes that. It's um, that's really what that film is all about. It's the supernatural because it's Halloween. You know? um, I think some have alluded to the fact that without the mask, Michael Myers is powerless, which I thought was always interesting. It's possible. Because there's that moment when his mask is taken off uh, by Laurie Strode, and then he you know, carefully adjusts and puts it back on his face, and then he's shot. Uh, you know, who knows? It could be. It could very well be. When he uh, kills his sister at the beginning of the film, uh, as a young boy, he's wearing a mask, and he puts it on. So, uh, yeah. I think there's clearly something to it. It's just a haunting picture. One of the best, you know, of its kind ever. I mean, I don't really even think of it as a slasher picture, really. Um, or splatter flick. It's hardly any of those things. So, now that it's approaching its 35th anniversary, I would hope people would check it out. Um, younger people, hopefully, can be reminded what real suspense can be. You don't need gore every five minutes to make something suspenseful, and I think that's the key. Um, so I hope people check it out. And Halloween, it's a true masterpiece in the, in its genre. Um, nothing else comes close to that one for you know for uh, for the atmospheric power of it more than anything else. So do check it out. And uh, for those who haven't seen it, or of course if you have. And it'd certainly be worthwhile seeing that in a big screen. And uh, this is Jerry the Movies with your host, Jerry Sadovia, signing off.